Okay, everyone, it's 1130. Um, I want to be respectful of your time, but we do have several that are still trying to dial in. And so we're going to give them one extra minute. And so um, bear with us for about another minute, and then we'll get started. Okay, well welcome everyone. Thanks for taking time to join us today. My name is Van Thompson and I'll be your host. So just before we start, a little bit about myself. I've been with Barnhart for a little over 13 years now and I've spent time in the field as a project engineer. I've served on our training team, I did a stint with our equipment logistics team, um, and I currently have the pleasure of serving as a manager of our engineering sales support team. And before we get too deep into things, I want to start by pointing out what we're not going to be talking about. So the word gantry conjures images of a variety of different things for different people. So for many of you, the word gantry brings to mind a steel or aluminum or some type of fixed structure that's either static or it moves on wheels, but there's no hydraulic components. And there's no doubt that these tools are useful and they've got a place in our industries. We here at Barnhart, we use them regularly. They're great for motor swap outs or things in a shop, but they're not the focus of our discussion. So what I'm talking, what I'm diving into today are your classic telescopic hydraulically powered mobile lifting units. And here's a picture that gives a good visual of the type of arrangements we're gonna be reviewing today. And so again, I just really want to welcome you here, and on behalf of Barnhart, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to spend with us. And some of you already have a really good understanding of hydraulic gantries, and for you, this is going to be a review, it'll be a reminder. But some of you haven't been around these tools, and hopefully you'll come away from our time together with a better understanding of the basics of this useful equipment. Now, all right, as you can see, our agenda is pretty short. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through the components that make up a typical gantry arrangement. We're going to look at some of their advantages over other industry um, uh, accepted lifting arrangements. And then we're going to look at some things to consider that are specific to gantries. And then I want to end with some cool pictures and some non-standard jobs. Uh, if along the way, if you think of anything, please feel free to type your questions or your thoughts or comments into our Q&A box. We've got some really sharp panelists on the call that will help answer questions as I go along. And then we're gonna have a Q&A time at the end where we can address those as well. Okay, so let's start and look at the components of a typical gantry assembly. So uh, we'll start at the very top and looking at our header beams. So these are typically wide flange members um, you can also use built-up box-shaped members, but these are what actually is taking the, the, the load you're lifting uh, from your rigging out to the main gantry legs. And next we've got the header beam links and the rigging. So these can look like a variety of different things, but typically you've got some type of um, burned out plate or weldment that based, that takes the load from the rigging and puts it to the center of your header beam so that load can, again, the goal is getting the load to the gantry legs. Moving on uh, to the gantry legs themselves. So again, we'll go into these in, in greater detail, but you'll typically find two different types of gantry legs. One is a exposed cylinder to where you actually can see the chrome 
of the main lifting cylinder, the hydraulic cylinder, and the other is a boom style. So in this particular picture, you've got exposed lift systems uh, is the manufacturer 44A unit. Next, we've got the pump unit. So this is the heart of the gantry unit. This is what supplies the hydraulic fluid at pressure that's actually used to lift the load. And these are typically, these pumps are either diesel powered, uh, propane, you can find them electric, based all sorts of different modes of powering them to meet the needs of the site that you're working at. And next, we've got the gantry track. And so your gantry track is typically three feet center to center um, of the members. Some are a little, some are narrower at two feet. Others are a little wider, depending on the capacity and the make and model. Um, some units have got spanning capabilities. Others that don't. Again, gantry. The one of the beauties of a gantry arrangement is a very modular system. And so there's lots of different parts and pieces that you can use to fit the needs that you see most often. And finally, we've got cribbing or matting, and this is used because oftentimes when you're using a gantry arrangement, your supporting surface isn't dead level, and so you've got to use different shimming material to make sure that you're within tolerance, and we'll talk about that shortly. Okay, now let's zero in and look at the components of an actual gantry leg. And so like I mentioned, there's two different varieties that you see most common. One is the bare cylinder model that you see on the left-hand picture, and the other is a telescopic boom section that you see in the right. Starting at the top again, you've got the header or the crown plate, and this is the connection piece between the bottom of your header beam and the top of your gantry. So oftentimes it's equipped with either holes where you can bolt clamping uh, plates or give you something to put a uh, uh, a boilermaker clamp, something that's going to keep a positive connection between the top, between the bottom flange of your header beam and the top of your gantry cylinder. Some units, not all units, but some units have what's called a manual or a dead section. Um, oftentimes, this is not a hydraulically powered unit. You don't, you know, if you were to cut it in half, you wouldn't have, you would not cut through a hydraulic cylinder but it can be lifted with the hydraulic cylinder, pinned off to your first stage, and then your cylinder retracts and pins back into your first stage. So a little confusing there, I understand, but the main thing to remember is if you, that manual, that dead section, if you were to um, cut it right through the middle, you, you wouldn't have a cylinder there. It's just a fixed piece that's pinned to the top of your first stage. And that's only in boom style. You don't, you don't see that in the exposed bare cylinder models. And next you have your traditional telescopic cylinder sections. Um, these, are, these are what give the hydraulic gantry the height. So most gantry legs are comprised of multi-stage lift cylinders. Um, and then you've got the base section, and this is what houses the different stages of your cylinder. And then you got the housing unit, and that's where you've got the main guts of the leg. That's where the hydraulic motors that drive the cylinder. That's where you've got your valving, your, your hydraulic plumbing for the unit. Um, there's also compartments to keep different accessories that are useful. Uh, the collar that pins off the dead section. Most of the time, that's where you're able to keep different pieces that you'll need to use in the field. So. Uh, if you can't find it, chances are it's in the housing unit along with, if you're, if you're like other sites, water bottles and other trash that shouldn't be in there. And then finally, at the base of it, you've got your wheel assemblies. And it's pretty obvious that these are the, this is what um, interfaces with your track and what propels the, lifts up the, the unit down the line. Okay. So let's look at some advantages of hydraulic gantries. And to get an honest picture of the advantages of gantries, we really have to create a comparison here. So it's hard to see an advantage unless you stack it up against something else. 
So let's start by comparing a standard four-leg gantry arrangement to a crane. And first off, it should be noticed that there's obviously applications in which a crane is the best solution. So if you have a wide open space, if you've got to lift a piece of equipment up and over tall utilities, um, if you've got lighter weight objects, these are all situations where it's very likely that a crane is hard to beat, and it's the tool of choice. But what about when space is limited and the piece is really heavy? And I'm, I'm talking 250,000 pounds and above type of heavy. In these type of situations, gantry arrangements take up less real estate than most industry standard hydraulic cranes and are for sure take up less space than any lattice boom crawler that you'll find on the market. Most gantry arrangements utilize track sections that are four foot or less in width which the advantage of that is it means when you're working in a congested space with several other contractors, you're only taking up a total width of eight feet, four foot for one side of the gantry, four foot for the other. Now the length of track varies, but the beauty of a gantry arrangement is that you can add track just in time prior to setting the equipment. So you can have enough track set up to set your four legs of gantries, your header beams, and then if you have to travel that arrangement, you can set that track uh, just before you need to set the equipment. Really gives you some flexibility in your construction schedule. And secondly, when you look at the crane in the picture on the right, what I really want you to see is a really big balance. So imagine a seesaw at the playground. To lift a load at a certain radius, you've got to have a lot of counterweight on the back side of the crane to balance things about that slewing bearing. So the more load you have on the front side of the crane, the more load you have to have on the back side of the crane to keep things in balance. And that counterweight makes the crane heavier and requires multiple truck loads to mobilize from one project to the next. Now gantries, on the contrary, they don't rely on balancing loads about a slewing bearing, and so therefore they don't require counterweight. So what this means is that you've got a system that's capable of lifting more than 500,000 pounds, but may require as little as three truckloads. And so when you compare that to a similar capacity hydraulic crane or even a crawler, you may be saving a minimum of 10 to 12 truckloads, not to mention the time it takes to stack out your counterweight and the place, the, the space you have to hold the trucks that hold the counterweight. So a lot of advantages of being able to take these hydraulic gantries and stick them into tighter spaces. And so like I mentioned, and that's a big advantage to hydraulic gantry arrangements, is their ability to be customized specifically for a particular site. So that's, as I mentioned, they're a modular system and they can be tailored to overcome some, some pretty specific site challenges. So let's say you've got a void in your supporting surface. Well, a gantry track can span over that. If you've got overhead power lines nearby where you're wanting to make a lift, the gantries can be rigged really tight to the piece and they can sneak beneath the lines all the while maintaining OSHA approved clearances. If you're unloading from a rail site and the site isn't conducive to cranes, a gantry system can be set up to straddle the rails and straddle the load and then either lift it and allow the trailer to drive up on the rails and underneath the piece once you get the rail car out of the way. Or in some situations, you can index the piece using a skidding system and so your trailer can be, on, can be just adjacent to your rail spur. So rather than making modifications to accommodate the site, it's often possible to configure gantries to efficiently make the lift with no site modifications. All right, so we've talked about the advantages gantries have in comparison to cranes. Now let's shift to another tried and true method for load, for load handling, and that's jacking and sliding. And I want to draw your attention real quick to the Barnhart website. We've got several uh, pre-recorded webinars that we put, and one of them in particular is about horizontal load movement. 
and I and that does a great job of diving into greater detail on how to slide objects, use rollers, different methods for moving loads horizontally. Um, and so, in a nutshell, we're going to we're going to talk specifically here about jacking and sliding. But in a nutshell, jacking and sliding a load involves using hydraulic cylinders or jacks to lift a load to a height. Basically, to a height where you can get some skidding beams underneath it. And you make sure the skid beams are pointed in the direction you want to go. And then you use your hydraulic jacks to then, in reverse order, and lower the load back to that slide system, back to that skidding system. And then, once you've got it on the skid system, then you can just push the load down the line along those beams in the direction that you need to go. Um, Again, this is a tried and true method. At Barnhart, we use this uh, every day. I mean, it's it's great. But the issue is, is these evolutions of lifting the load, cribbing, resetting the jack, having to put your slide beams in, making sure the slide beams are level, making sure they're pointed in the right direction. If you have to go multiple directions, that can be challenging. Um, it can be time consuming and labor intensive. Now, I'll admit, Gantry arrangements, they do require shimming and cribbing of the track, but oftentimes it's minimal. And the advantage that you have is that you can go nearly immediately from lifting a load to then traveling it down in a direction that you need to go. So much more fluid motion, and they're advantageous when you need to go set pieces down to things like foundations or anchor bolts, because you don't have to, um, you've got the anything that's, floating is oftentimes easier to set than if you're trying to lower it precisely down onto anchor bolts. And I'll say this, nothing in our industry in the heavy lift, heavy transport is considered fast, uh, but you can certainly complete most scopes of work in less time using gantries versus a traditional jack and slide technique. Okay. Well, now I want to dive into things to consider when you're planning out or working with a gantry arrangement. When it comes to gantries, there's definitely way more things to consider than what I've got time to cover. If you have a set of gantries, I highly, highly, highly recommend reading the operator's manual, manual before you ever attempt to assemble the arrangement. Um, but I do want to cover some of the high points. And as with most lifting devices, one of the most important things to consider is what's supporting your lifting device. In this regard, gantry, gantry applications, they're no different than crane jobs. It's extremely important that the heavy lift provider work closely with the site controlling entity to ensure that the ground or the floor has adequate bearing capacity. You can have the most thought out, well-planned uh, crane lift or gantry arrangement but if you're setting up on soil or surface that isn't designed to handle the load, your day can end in disaster. And remember what we said earlier, and because gantries are often a lighter weight solution than cranes, they can be much more conducive to use in areas that have got a slightly lower ground bearing pressure. And so we've talked about checking the ground, that's, that's key. Um, well, there's also some things that get a little bit more particular to gantries, and so we're going to talk about those. So gantries are, are oftentimes, uh, they're, they're supported by steel track, and pictured here, we've got a Barnhart Design tube track. It's made of HSS tube steel, which means it, it's highly, it's got high capacity, it's lighter weight than some other tracks you'll see on the market that utilize a wide, you know, a, a high grade wide flange member. And the, the really nice part about this tube track is it's torsion resistant. So each one of those main members is highly resistant to any torsional effects. But the main, that's, all, that's all well and good, but the main thing to remember and to consider when it comes to your gantry track is keeping it level. Um, it's super, I can't stress enough how important it is to keep the gantry track level. And here's the criteria that ASME calls out and there'd be 30.1 standard. And so as you can see, um, we've got the ASME standard and then here at Barnhart, 
we we drill that down a little bit more and make sure that our operators can understand and what that looks like on in a four foot level. And the main reason why we focus so heavily on how level the track is, is because everything that rides on top of the track is affected by that proportionally. And so here's what I mean. So take a look at the two gantry legs on the right hand of the screen. So level leg one is supported by a level track and it's extended roughly 22 feet and it's nice and plumb. And it's very important to monitor the gantry legs to ensure that they remain plumb. So now leg two, it may look similar to one, and if you're far enough away, it may look like it's plumb, but that can be deceiving. Again, it's important to put a four-foot level on there. In this particular case, I've got leg two drawn one at the base one inch out of level, which correlates to, if you, if, uh, if you take that all the way to the top, that one inch out of levelness at the base translates to over six inches of drift at the top. And so trying to lift the load with this magnitude of deflection can cause uncontrolled movement of your load and really damage the internal cylinder. And you also have to be especially precise if you're using a stacked track arrangement. So that means uh, you may use that in cases where you don't have quite enough stroke with your gantry, uh, gantry leg by itself. And so you need to get that, excuse me, get that base unit up uh, four or five feet. And so remember, if you are stacking that up, everything that that gantry leg is on, uh, if it's out of level, that gantry leg is cor is correspondingly out of level, is proportionally out of level is a better way to say that. And so minor, le minor deflections and layers, they're additive and they can lead to disaster. So it's very important to not use compressible material between, e between any layers of your stack track arrangement. So um, steel shims versus plywood, uh, don't use compressible rubber. Um, just make sure that when you're putting a load on that stacked arrangement that nothing's gonna compress differentially and allow the system to get out of level. It's also worth pointing out another issue you face when you use hydraulic gantries uh, with the telescopic cylinders, in particular, the boom style cylinders. And so these boom cylinders have slider wear pads that you can see here shown in red um, that keep the section parallel relative to the other sections. And if these slider pads are out of tolerance, you stand the chance of inducing additional drift into the system when the cylinder boom sections, when they when they're skew relative to each other. And so, again, that's why proper maintenance is important, making sure that those wear pads are within spec um, and making sure that your arrangement is set up with an ASME tolerance of, of levelness. So another thing to consider, and, and here we have a, a standard JNR lift and lock style 500 ton gantry leg. And when this gantry leg is in operation, one of the most important things to watch out for is the mode that this leg is in. And so let me explain. And so the hydraulics of a gantry leg are plumbed such that you have selector valves that divert, um, that divert that hydraulic fluid either into the main lift cylinders for when you're actually lifting the load or into the hydraulic drive motors when you're trying to travel the load. And there's also a freewheel setting that allows the fluid to bypass the hydraulic motor. And this is what you use when you're lifting a load, but you want to allow the legs to move slightly just to find center. Now the potential pitfall here is when you have four legs of gantry, but they aren't all set to the same mode. And this, this folks is when disaster can strike. So for example, let's say that you're lifting a load and you've got four legs, but legs one, one, two, and three are all set to lift you want to lift. But four is mistakenly set to travel. So when you start pushing fluid to that four-leg arrangement, you'll have three legs start to try and come up, uh, but that fourth leg is going to walk out from beneath the system. And conversely, if you've got multiple legs mistakenly in lift when you're wanting to travel, 
then you run the risk of having two legs or however many legs that are in lift come up while the other legs are trying to walk out from beneath. And you can lose a load simply because you're not paying attention to levels, to levers. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to before you move the load, lift the load, do anything with the load, you're walking around your arrangement and ensuring that each leg is in the proper mode. And the last consideration point I want to make is how important it is to size the gantry arrangement, not just for the load you're lifting, but you've got to take into account what you plan to do with the load. So here's what I mean. So let's say we want to lift a generator that weighs 375 tons. Now, uh, the generator in this picture was, wasn't nearly this heavy, um, but for the sake of argument, let's say we're lifting a generator that weighs 375 tons, and I need to lift that generator. I need to travel it in, and I need to lift it up and over a pedestal that requires 14 foot of stroke to get up and over it. Now, you may be tempted to think that the 450 ton J and R's that are shown in this picture are the ticket. The legs, the four leg arrangement, it's good for 475 tons. My generator only weighs 375 tons. That leaves 75 tons, a full 150,000 pounds to cover rigging, header beams. I should have plenty of capacity, right? Well, hold on. Let's take a look at the load chart for those gantries and see if they're really the right equipment for the job. And so as you can see from the chart, the legs do have, do in fact have a 450 ton capacity, but only in the first stage. So your first stage takes you from a retracted height of 10 foot two, all the way up to 23 foot one, and that's assuming that you extend and pin the dead section. But that's only 12 foot 11 worth of stroke, and we needed 14 feet. So it's not enough stroke, which means you're gonna have to go into the second stage of this, of this unit. And as you can see based on the chart, that reduces your overall capacity to 320 tons, which is less than the 375 tons that you're lifting. And so these are the type of issues that have got to be considered and addressed prior to showing up on site. In this hypothetical case, the solution to a problem may be as simple as cribbing the track up, or it may mean we bring in another set of gantries that have got a higher capacity at higher, uh, higher strokes. And I'm not going to go into too much depth on this, but like any other rigging arrangement, it's really important um, that the rigging to the piece be properly sized. And so with the gant with gantries, there's a risk of either three-pointing or cross-cornering the load. So we recommend that if possible, you size your rigging for either a third or even half of the weight of the piece. And so this is always assuming the center of gravity of the load is symmetrically placed beneath between the legs. Um, but if you do have some asymmetry, if so, if the, if the load is closer to two legs of gantries than it is the other, you've got to make sure and calculate the load that's on each individual gantry leg and ensure that each individual gantry leg is sized appropriately. And the header beam that you're using should also be properly checked to ensure it has adequate strength. And again, I can't stress enough, if you're side shifting the load, don't just look at the capacity of your system when it's in its initial static condition. You've got to uh, you've got to analyze it both when you've lifted it and you've slid it over as far as you need, and make sure that you're analyzing the shear, bending, deflection, all the local effects that can cause um, can cause problems if they're not properly if the unit's pro not properly sized correctly. Okay, so. That's a lot to consider, and I didn't even go through everything that you can you should consider before executing a gantry job. I just hit some of the high points, but I do want to just to drive home the point. I want to show you a video that will hopefully um, just show the importance of a of thorough planning when it comes to gantry lists. And many many of you have probably seen this. Um, I will I will say the audio is pretty loud, and so maybe a good time to turn down the audio a little bit. Uh, but check out this video of a pretty poorly performed lift. As, as you can see, when they first started lifting, that rigging was out of plumb. So as they came up, 
and it came off of the trailer, you had a side load in there that uh, was was induced a uh, overturning moment that was more than those gantry legs could handle. And then on top of that, there was no positive connection between the top of those beam, the, the header beam, and the top of the legs. So really bad day for everybody involved, and um, I hope that I hope that nobody on the call has to experience something like that. Okay, so we've walked through what comprises a gantry arrangement. We've compared gantry arrangements to other load handling tools, and we've seen their advantages. And we've talked through some key considerations when you're planning a gantry job. And I want to end by showing you some uh, some additional gantry setups. Let's get into some pictures. And throughout this presentation, I've included lots of pictures of what I would consider pretty pretty standard gantry arrangements, four legs, two header beams, and, and loads rigged beneath the beam. And so now I want to mix it up and end our time by going through a few non-standard jobs that showcase some creative ways to utilize some gantries. Uh, the first job that I want to highlight was at an aluminum mill in South Carolina, and there were several scopes associated with the, this overall project, but I'm just going to touch on the setting. We had to set four 250,000-pound mill stands, and then we had to set two 120,000 pound gearboxes. To set the mill stands, we used a combination of our JNR 600 ton gantry units, as a, and we used those as a main lifting device, and we used two legs of our custom 500 ton one shots as our tailing gantries. So we had to take these mill stands from horizontal, we had to take them up to vertical, travel them in, and set them down. Um, these mill stands came in on a six-line self-propelled trailer, uh, and then we upended them, like I said, and then we had to we swiveled them with a, a, a swivel hanging from our custom box girders that you see in this picture. And here's a view from the back side of the arrangement, and we repeated this operation four times to set each mill stand. For the gearboxes, we reassembled the same gantries in a different location just adjacent to the mill stands. And for this scope, the gearboxes came in a, a different plant entrance via the trailer. We offloaded them with our 500 ton one shots and then set it to our 100 ton slide system and slid them from the area where they were able to come into the building um, to over to our gantry arrangement that was set up on the other side of some columns that would then take the gearboxes and translate them over to the final set position. So here's a picture uh, of our box girders with the 450 ton JNRs, and this this picture is shown after they've been slid over there, lifted up, and then we used our gantry arrangement to set them. So lots of moving parts, but the things that I want to highlight are the high capacity and versatility of gantry systems, as well as the ability to carry the load beneath main structural members. So as you can see right here, you've got some main column, um, some uh, beams that are making up the roof structure here that we were able to get underneath. Um, and again, same gantry legs, reconfigured in different arrangements on site, so you're reducing the amount of equipment that you've got to bring in for different scopes just because it's versatile and can be used in different type of arrangements. Okay, so that, that's a lot of trying to describe it verbally. I want, I've got a video of that arrangement that will hopefully bring a little bit more clarity. in the mill stands, a vending them. And then we use the 450 tons to walk them in, rotate them as we go, and set them in place. Having them hanging from above gave us a lot of versus gave us a lot of wiggle room and the ability to set them uh, easily on the ankle.
Now we're moving over to setting the gearbox. You can see just adjacent to the mill stand. The same equipment, just configured differently. Okay, so the second job that I want to highlight is the lifting and lowering of an overhead crane at another aluminum mill in Kentucky. And so for this project, our scope was to lift, rotate, and lower an overhead crane that, that had 100-foot-long bridge girders and weighed 268,000 pounds. So the client needed to lower this overhead crane so that another crane um, could frog jump it. This crane was in need of repairs and it needed to get to the other end of the plant. And from grade to the bottom of the bridge girders was approximately 40 feet. So to minimize our footprint on the mill floor, our solution involved using four legs of 450 ton J&Rs coupled with our custom high strength box girders that you'll see in this picture and our 750 ton hydraulic turntable. And this turntable allowed us to control the rotation of the bridge girders after we, can, we extended the gantries to lift the load. And the turntable also gave us a wide enough base to support the crane so that we retained stability throughout the whole operation. Here's some more pictures. And here's a quick video that's going to show the lifting and lowering in action. We get up on the load. And our hydraulic turntable allows us to spin it. We bring it down, and then the client brings the other crane up and over on the other side. Looks simple. Lots of planning went in to make sure that this job was a success. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't give credit and recommend further reading into today's topic. And there's four pieces of literature that I think are great and uh, really valuable resources uh, when it comes to gantries and, and hydraulic systems. And they all go into a lot more detail than I've managed to rumble through today. And like everything else, you can find them on Amazon. And so um, definitely recommend checking these two out. The first two are... SCNRA's recommended practice for telescopic hydraulic gantry systems. But I would say probably at the forefront is this book on the right here, and that's Dave Dewar's uh, book, Telescopic Hydraulic Gantry Systems. The two other pieces of literature that I really recommend are Keith Anderson's Rigging Engineering Basics, which is essentially a heavy lift and transport encyclopedia. Uh, we use it regularly around here, the Barnhart Engineering Department. And then uh, the ASME's B30.1 standard on jacks, rollers, air casters, and specifically hydraulic gantries, which is chapter 1.6 in the standard. Uh, that's all we've got today, folks. I really appreciate everybody staying with me, taking time to learn more about a key heavy lift tool. Um, we've got several more webinars lined out for the rest of the summer and into the fall, and so be on the lookout for future invites. Do want to take a few minutes and see if we've got any questions that we can address? Hey, Van, here's one from Daniel. Can the dead section for the telescopic boom type gantries be changed out for different heights? That's a really good question. Um, it, at Barnhart, we typically do not just because we uh, – the, the units are designed for a specific length that's from the manufacturer, but I would recommend contacting the manufacturer of the unit and uh, posing that question to them. So they've always been willing to work with us for different modifications. And here's one from Jeff. What are the plates on the bottom of the gantry track? Um, the plates on the bottom of the Barnhart gantry track, those are uh, load distributing mats. And so our tube, our 10 inch tube style tracks are equipped with four by a little over six foot long mats that can rotate in both directions and take the load from that gantry and the gantry track and distribute it over pretty wide areas. So that allows us to take heavy loads and really spread them out to meet lower site allowable 
ground bearing pressures? It's a good question. Great, great. And if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to go ahead and submit those in the Q&A box at this time. And Van, the last one I see, and I'll take one more look uh, while you're addressing this one, is from Steve. Is there a practical limit on weight or height for these type systems? Uh, good question, Steve. I would say practical limit really has a lot to do, and I may be I may be misinterpreting your question, and if, if so, contact me after the webinar. But um, practical limit really boils down to trucking. Um, what you're seeing in the industry now is higher capacity gantries that are getting up into the 1,000 ton, 1,300 ton, and they're really great. They can get you up to 40 feet with heavy loads, um, but but it's going to be you, you'll spend more in trucking to get them there. So you know you'll only be able to get say one housing plus uh, some track on a on a single truckload. Whereas some of the lower capacity units that have got a lighter housing weight, uh, you can ship them around a little bit easier. Great. And here's here's one more from William. Can you weigh the load? using gantries to validate the total weight? Uh, you can definitely look at the hydraulic pressures that you're seeing. And if you know the ERA of the leg, which uh, you can get from the manufacturer's data, you can get an idea of what kind of load you're seeing on each leg and then translate that back to a total combined system weight. Great. Yeah, a little bit of basic math, and sure, you can. Great, great. That's all I see, Van. Okay. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're um, at Barnhart. We're here to help you, and so feel free to reach out to reach out to us if there's any solutions that we can help you solve.